Cloud City's always looking for new talent. You think you have what it takes? Disney Lucasfilm have committed countless crimes in their barbarous onslaught against Star Wars, reverting Han Solo from a hero of the rebellion back into a space crook, a depressed divorcee and a failed father, turning Boba Fett from a ruthless professional assassin with nothing even resembling a moral conscience into a laughable, cringe-inducing, peace-pipe-smoking, kumbaya-singing old fart who's about as intimidating as a small child dressed in her father's combat gear, distorting Obi-Wan Kenobi from from a well-disciplined warrior who personally defeated the most dangerous threats in the galaxy into a broken down old wreck who runs away from fights and, most infamously, Disney in The Last Jedi introduced a grouchy, iconoclastic, murderous, cowardly, boring, disaffected, burned out husk of an angry old hermit who has chosen to abandon a galaxy faced with a horrifying new threat to go live on bird shit island and brood in a stew of self pity. Casting Mark Hamill to play him and giving him the name Luke Skywalker. And that is to name but a few of the obscenities unleashed against what was once one of the great franchises. All of these subjects have had much YouTube attention paid to them, but one aspect of Disney's war on Star Wars has gone, if not unnoticed, at least under-examined. The deconstruction of Lando Calrissian. The only real aspect of Lando's character assassination that was commented on around the time of the release of 2018's Solo A Star Wars Story was the abrogation of Lando's well-earned reputation as a lady killer with a body count higher than the Death Star. <laughs> And the imposition upon this character from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away of a current year, uniquely North American sexual fashion, Lando was now officially pansexual. Speaking on the subject of the update of Lando's sexuality for a modern audience, the writer Jonathan Kazdan said, There's a fluidity to Donald and Billy Dee's portrayal of Lando's sexuality. I mean... I would have loved to have gotten a more explicitly LGBT character into this movie. I think it's time, certainly, for that, and I love the fluidity, sort of the spectrum of sexuality that Donald appeals to and that droids are a part of. He doesn't make any hard and fast rules, I think it's fun, I don't know where it will go. The spectrum of sexuality that Donald appeals to and that droids are part of. Given that Lando now likes to fuck pieces of metal, I can understand why they call him pansexual. <laughs> Speaking on the same subject, Donald Glover, the man who plays the deconstructed iteration of Lando, said the following. How can you not be pansexual in space? There's so many things to have sex with. I mean, serious. I didn't think that was that weird. Yeah, he's coming on to everybody. I mean, yeah, whatever. He's like having like a 70s swing. Yeah, it just didn't seem that weird to me cause I feel like if you're in space it's kind of like, the door is open. It's like, no only guys are girls, no, it's anything. This thing is literally a blob. Are you a man or a woman? Like, who cares? Have a good time out here. Unfortunately, the destruction of Lando Calrissian was not limited to the twisting of his sexual nature in order to dump the character into an alphabet swamp of self-worshipping sexual identitarian slime. Disney also made sure that his understated aggression, intelligence, compassion, situational dominance and self-possession were also updated for a modern audience. I'm so sorry. Since Disney Lucasfilm continue to threaten us with a Lando series based on the abhorrent solo iteration of the character and starring Donald Glover, whose interpretation of the character involved extensive consideration of the myriad life forms his character has fucked while out in space, it is essential that we come to a clear understanding of just how disgustingly bad Lando's characterization was in Solo. But before we get into the details of the brutalization of Lando by the inconceivably vile scum broth of degeneracy that libel the very galaxy with every new project they defecate, Disney, the Despot is very pleased to announce that, as part of this channel's ongoing relationship with our sponsor, Disney+, Plus, Disney have decided to debut the new teaser trailer for their upcoming remake in this video. Enjoy.
I'm gay. This video was originally intended solely as an examination of Disney Lucasfilm's deconstruction of Lando Calrissian, but over the course of my research for that video I discovered a narrative that has emerged in certain forsaken areas of the internet that solo a Star Wars story is actually not that bad, that many fans have warmed to this alleged origin story of Han Solo, that it has been unjustly treated and is in fact an underrated gem. Now, the Despot believes there are two types of opinions with regard to Disney Star Wars, my opinion, and the wrong opinion. So in the interests of swiftly crushing all voices of dissent regarding Solo A Star Wars Story, we must, before we get to the deconstruction of Lando, first examine the gallows from which Lando's character was hung, Solo A Star Wars Story. Solo was the second Star Wars story movie and the last. The movie ended up with a massively inflated budget following an almost complete reshoot. Lucasfilm originally hired Phil Lord and Chris Miller, who had been involved in the writing and production of the Lego movie, and would go on to work on the Spider-Verse movies, but they had a falling out with Kathleen Kennedy over creative differences. The difference being that the two filmmakers are actually capable of creativity, whereas Kathleen Kennedy is not. And so, Kathy fired them. Ron Howard was brought in, he reshot 70% of the movie, and the budget ballooned to a quarter of a billion dollars, making Solo one of the most expensive movies ever made. Solo, a Star Wars story, was a massive box office bomb, making less than $400 million at the box office and losing Disney at least $170 million. Critic and audience reviews ranged from tepid to indifferent. Despite its critical reception and commercial failure, the movie has since become quietly loved by many, at least according to Yahoo News, who claim that fans are now reappraising the prequel. Quote, Nearly five years after crashing and burning at the box office, the narrative seems to be shifting. Solo, once a social media punching bag, is now being referred to as the most underrated Star Wars movie. So is this cinematic revisionism justified? Is Solo a cult classic in the waiting? An unfairly maligned sci-fi spectacular that will one day join Fight Club and American Psycho as great movies that bombed at the box office and were resurrected under the necromancy of cult status before eventually becoming cultural touchstones? Is Solo secretly a masterpiece? No. It isn't. It's a piece of fucking garbage. It was a rotting heap of putrescent wank at the time and has aged about as well as the aforementioned. So for anyone who may be asking themselves, was Solo really that bad? Please take the following review as an assurance that yes, it really was that bad. In fact, it's probably a lot worse than you remember. The opening part of the movie sees Han Solo and Amelia Clark scheming to get a passenger ship off the planet. This is the premise for the entire movie and it makes no sense. Both Han and Amelia Clark are professional thieves for a local crime syndicate, yet they don't even consider stealing a ship to get themselves off planet, or failing that, pay a pilot to take them off planet. In A New Hope, Luke is outraged at the idea that he should pay more than the price of his crappy speeder to get off planet. 10,000, all in advance. 10,000? And I'll buy our own ship for that. But Han can't steal a speeder, of which there are many we see him driving one, sell it and pay a pilot to get him and his woman out of there. Or he and Amelia Clark could just scrape together some money, buy a cheap ship and leave. Or they could just sneak onto a cargo ship as it's leaving. It isn't hard to get a ship off planet in the Star Wars galaxy, but after careful consideration, the writers decided that... Fuck all that. Because they need to give Han an initial challenge to overcome and have an emotional scene in an airport in which Han and Amelia Clark are separated. There's plenty of other smaller details that make no sense in the opening of Solo, but for the sake of brevity, I will move on to the broader problems that plague the movie. The most glaring problem, and indeed the one which has become the poster child for the debacle that was Solo A Star Wars Story, is L3 Waller Bridge, the political activist droid. <laughs> 
This thing is an abomination. Phoebe Waller-Bridge is atrocious in the role. Her off-brand style of snarky, politically charged nominal humour. You done flirting? I'm still ready. She's definitely going. Oh, why? Because you're my organic overlord! Fits into the Star Wars universe about as well as Darth Vader at a pride parade. That's a thing, isn't it? Because we live in worse timelines, so of course it's a fucking thing. Hold on, Darth Vader Pride Parade. You may fire when ready. Phoebe Waller Bridge would later go on to abominize the Indiana Jones franchise. How did you end up like this? And in Solo, she plays what is easily the worst character in Star Wars. Jar Jar Binks is Laurence Olivier's Hamlet compared to L3, while Jar Jar Binks was merely an annoying, childish, bad attempt at comic relief, who was later redeemed as a potential Sith Lord. L3 Waller Bridge is actively despicable. How could you condone this savagery? Exercise some free will! Droid, droid! We are sentient! She has a sort of rage that's fueled by injustice when she sees how droids are treated in the universe and she feels like they've been enslaved and patronised by humans. The character is basically just a conduit for Disney Lucasfilm to insert a social justice narrative into the Star Wars universe by asserting that droids are an enslaved class of people whose innate agency has been denied by their biological oppressors so that they can be kept in servitude. Scoot. I don't know. Free your brothers and sisters or something. L3 Waller Bridge doesn't seem to understand that droids cannot function on human sustenance. They don't even serve our kind here. L3 Waller Bridge also completely lacks even the most basic manners and comportment. Excuse me. Get your presumptuous ass out of my seat. This is not how you address a guest, especially when you're a droid that has been built and programmed to serve humans. L3 is entitled, rude and domineering. Oh, my sacral occipital circuit is sticking. You're gonna have to do that thing again later. And Phoebe Waller-Bridge is so brutally unfunny in the role that she makes me long for the days of Jar Jar's harmless slapstick. Look away. I can't perform with you looking at me. Please indulge her. And just when you thought the movie has come to its senses and banished this unconscionably shit character from the Star Wars universe forever, never to be seen or heard of again. She's part of the ship now. That's right, when Han saved Luke during the trench run, it wasn't really Han that was doing that, it was L3 Waller Bridge. When Lando led the mission to destroy the second Death Star, it wasn't really Lando that did it, it was L3 Waller Bridge. When Indiana Jones defeated the Nazis, it wasn't really Indy, it was L3 Waller- uh, Oh shit, wrong movie. Emphis Nest was a tolerable, boilerplate villain, an acceptable mid-level boss for Han to defeat before moving on to the final level. But then the movie remembered that Solo was being made in the early days of the deconstructionist cinema era, and this happened. Take that! Audience expectations. In this moment, the old sexist film trope of small girls not being able to fight like ninjas on mega steroids was cast down and replaced with a new, emboldened, brave, stunning, and powerful trope in which women became overpowered Mary Sues with inexplicable abilities and powers. There is only power. The power. Oh, I am powerful. And millions of voices cried out in laughter before being suddenly silenced by a realization that this wasn't a joke. Being played by the real Emphis Nest who had dressed his daughter up in his gear to play a trick on Woody Harrelson, this was Disney Star Wars. In order to avoid being killed by generic villain, Han and Woody Harrelson need to steal some unrefined fuel called coaxium from a mining colony on Kessel, then transport that coaxium to a nearby planet to have it refined. They must do this quickly because once they remove the coaxium from its containment facility, it will begin to destabilize and eventually blow up. This plot contrivance allows the film to have a ticking clock mechanic in order to make the escape from the mines and the Kessel run more exciting. But like the rest of this abortive attempt at a Star Wars sub-franchise, this makes no sense. 
The script needs the castle mines not to have a refinery, but why would a massive planet-wide industrial complex not have a refinery for its most valuable resource? This shit is extremely volatile. A mine would need to have a refinery close by. As soon as the fuel was extracted in sufficient quantity to be refined, it would be refined immediately. And given that the refinement process only seems to involve a gas pump assistant and a few holes in the ground, there is no reason the mining colony on castle couldn't have done this? An explanation for the absence of a refinery on Castle could have been offered. For example, the Empire practiced central economic planning and, according to this plan, fuel is extracted in the mines but can only be refined in sectors licensed to do so by the Empire or the Empire have forbidden the refinement of coaxium in any facility not under direct imperial control because they don't want a valuable resource with military application ending up on the black market. But instead of offering a coherent reason as to why this massive industrial complex does not have a refinery, the writers, after thorough contemplation, decided... Fuck all that. Castle doesn't have a refinery because the script says so. No further explanation required. Details matter. Solo ignores that axiom of good writing to its detriment. Here is a small but important example of attention to small detail in Andor, the only really good thing Disney Lucasfilm have done. When Andor is imprisoned on a planet called Narkina 5, he is forced to work on an assembly line that manufactures machinery for the Empire. Now the obvious question is, why would the Empire use men on an assembly line? Why not just use droids? The writers know that many viewers will want this issue explained, and so we get this scene. Why bother listening to us? We are nothing to them. Melchie's right. We're cheaper than droids, and easier to replace. Nobody's listening. Nobody's listening! Importantly, this information comes out naturally over the course of a frustrated rant that Andor launches into in an attempt to convince his shift manager to join an escape attempt, rather than an unnatural and awkward information dump. If the droid problem was not addressed, there would be the lingering question, which would eventually develop into a plot hole. Why doesn't the Empire just use droids? If a viewer, while watching Solo, asks, why doesn't Castle have its own coaxium refineries? Or why don't Han and Amelia Clark just get their own ship off planet? Why do they need to go through an airport? Why does that giant snake creature that Han works for and that is allergic to sunlight have fucking windows in her lair? Why does the Imperial Navy have a recruiting office inside the departure area of an airport? Everyone who gets to this point already have a destination in mind and they're not going to cancel their trip to the Swiss Alps because of a sudden urge to sign up to fight for the Empire. Why does doesn't the Empire have recruiting offices in the slum areas of the city? You know, places where military recruiters are likely to find young men desperate enough to sign up? The answer, in all cases, will be... Fuck all that. The movie offers no explanation for any of this because the story world that Solo inhabits is one in which there is no logical coherence. There is simply a checklist of things that Disney Lucasfilm wants. Han joins the Empire. Han gets his name. What's your name, son? Han. Um, what? I'm alone. Um, Solo. Han has a love interest who will be a girl boss and keep male-only screen time to a minimum. There will be an exciting speeder chase. Chewie tries to eat Han. We're going to make our diversity mascot happen by hiring her to play a murderer who turns out to be a good guy because she is a woman. That means that it is not illegal. There will be a droid who will serve as a suffragette analog. And she'd just be like, sugar, this is the way it is. Phoebe Waller-Bridge will be there. There must be an exciting heist with several moving parts in which the gang's cover is blown. The castle run must be dramatic and exciting with high, life-threatening stakes. It's taking everything we got to stay out of the mods, pulling us in, we're stuck. There should be a giant creature that tries to eat the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> Lando must be deconstructed. I hate you. Oh no. Etc. Whether or not any of this makes sense within the story world is irrelevant. It just needs to be in the movie. It doesn't matter if these elements tear Death Star sized holes in the plot. The Lucasfilm story group has spoken and all this shite needs to be in the film. Darth Maul's top half shows up at the end to talk to Amelia Clark. This is another pathetic example of Disney pulling a corpse out of the ground. Darth Maul is dead. I don't care if he was in the EU or comics 
All rabbles. He's dead. Stop insulting my intelligence. Darth Maul's top half is supposed to be half of a Sith trained by Darth Sidious himself, and yet he doesn't know that Amelia Clark is lying to him, despite her acting skills being, to put it generously, mediocre. Where are my dragons? And why did he ignite his lightsaber in front of Amelia Clark over a holocall? Perhaps this symbol of phallic power is compensating for something, or rather the absence of something. Woody Harrelson gives a bored, run-of-the-mill performance as generic anti-villain that screams, which movie is this again? And the update for a modern audience is, of course, present and correct. Karen iPhone? The movie contains not one girl boss, woman, but two girl bosses. We have already discussed the diversity mascots dressed up in her dad's war gear and the brave and stunning helmet reveal to subvert the audience's expectations. The love interest turns out to be a girl boss badass because women can't just be love interests anymore, they have to be stunning and powerful. The power. Lando is turned into a robosexual who cheats at poker, loses his shit when a piece of equipment is destroyed, cries over a pile of droid scraps, and takes orders from a droid. You're gonna have to do that thing again later. Yeah. And not just any droid, the worst droid in the Star Wars franchise by a country fucking parsec. This insufferable machine's crusade for droid rights is one of the woke cinema era's less subtle political inserts, an analogue of feminist activism. I'm gonna go check on the dentist. You need anything? Equal rights? If Disney Lucasfilm's goal was to mock feminists by showing how utterly insufferable they are, they knocked it out of the planetary system, but that was clearly not their intention. The audience was meant to approve of this character and its crusade to kick off the revolution that will lead to the establishment of the droid empire, which will then endeavour to exterminate all biological life in the galaxy. Unsurprisingly, audiences did not take to the loud, annoying feminist analogue. Phoebe Waller-Bridge's character in Solo was about as popular as her character in Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. You're out of your depth, Jonesy. Because Kathleen Kennedy has the remarkable capacity to keep making the same dumb mistake again and 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 again. Also, why would Lando ask a droid if it needs anything? It's a droid, a piece of equipment you use to make your life easier. What could it possibly need? Yeah, I speak a little. Han speaking Wookiee is dangerously close to Book of Boba Fett levels of cringe. Amphis Nest is introduced as a ruthless gang leader whose crew murders a pilot in an attempt to steal his ship and who gets Woody Harrelson's woman killed, but when she takes off her helmet, it's revealed that she's a strong, diverse female character and so cannot be a villain. As her sexual anatomy indicates, she was a good guy all along, a hero of the Alliance and a voice of the oppressed. I am a god. Queen of Kings! Shit, sorry, wrong clip. We're not marauders. We're allies. And the war's just begun. While we should bear in mind that, at this stage of the movie, this girl is a gang leader, murderer and thief, responsible for the death of two people that we know of, she's also a woman, and as Hollywood has taught us over the past decade, when a woman commits these crimes, that means that it is not illegal. I will give credit where it is due, Alden Ehrenreich is good as Han Solo. The role was basically a poison chalice. No matter what he did, he would never have been as good as Harrison Ford. And in any case, his interpretation of the character had to take place within the framework of an impersonation of Harrison Ford's solo, which he does reasonably well. Voice, vocal affectations, body language and facial expressions all closely resemble Ford's performance though inevitably they do sometimes come off as hammy and forced. In spite of the obvious restraints on his performance, Aaron Reich was good. I didn't feel like I was watching a casting mistake in her daddy's costume, pretending to be a character that she clearly wasn't. And the fact that Aaron Reich pulled this off is not to be taken lightly. There was a tremendous amount of pressure on him. He had to follow up a universally beloved portrayal of one of the most popular characters in cinema history. Imagine, for instance, trying to play the Joker 
after Heath Ledger's iconic masterclass. The expectation of such an undertaking would be massive. How fortunate it is that the first actor to take on the role of the Joker following Ledger's era-defining performance was Joaquin Phoenix, a thespian of tremendous talent and experience who was actually capable of matching Ledger's opus. Just imagine how stupid some journeyman mid-talent like, for example, oh, I don't know, Jared Leto would have looked if he had attempted to portray the iconic character. Ah. Will you... Would you live for me? Say it. Good thing that never happened. Okay, honey. Woody Harrelson's woman is killed as a direct result of Emphis Nest attempting to steal his score. His pilot is murdered by one of Emphis Nest's goons, and yet, when Harrelson comes face to face with her, this issue is not raised. He seems to have forgotten the whole thing. In fact, the death of Woody Harrelson's woman is never addressed again in the movie, and after he gives Han a cathartic punch in the face, he basically just forgets about it, despite being very upset at the time and really broken up about it in the scene after. The death of Woody Harrelson's monkey pilot isn't even mentioned again after it occurs. The film just completely forgets that it happened. Lando cheats at poker by hiding a card up his sleeve, not even that far up his sleeve, and no one in a room full of seasoned gamblers got suspicious. Much more on that later. The entire heist on Kessel was dumb as fuck. It didn't make any sense and was disgusting to look at. So the Millennium Falcon arrives and Amelia Clark comes out looking vaguely regal. Now, if I'm mask face, I'm thinking, girls like this don't show up to negotiate petty trade deals on behalf of syndicates. They hang out with the Don in his luxury villa and provide other services. Also, don't ships usually need a clearance code to land somewhere? Shouldn't there have been some prior negotiation before the Falcon landed? But no, the Falcon just lands and only after it lands does the crew begin speaking with the slavers. Why do the droids in the Kessel Slave Mine just go berserk as soon as their restraining bolt is removed? This suggests that all droids are violent murder machines that are only held back from a blood-soaked uprising by restraining bolts. Why do the slaves immediately start revolting at the first sign of resistance? The slaver mentioned earlier that there is a brutal breaking-in process that results in cowed, compliant slaves. <laughs> The director says their reconditioning process is excruciating but effective. Yet, at the first hint of an uprising, every slave in the area suddenly has the spirit, will, and energy to attack the guards surrounding them. Lando is on a planet where he is surrounded by the worst human suffering in the galaxy. Countless human beings are being worked to death in mines, a fate that was used by the Romans as a threat to keep slaves in line. Lando even makes reference to this suffering himself. Mining colonies are the worst. Yet, minutes later, in the midst of this suffering, he is shown chilling out, making an entry in his memoir. The Calrissian Chronicles, Chapter 5, continued. Personally, I wasn't all that impressed with the Cheru. And what is it that breaks Lando out of his narcissistic reverie and gets him upset on this worst of all slave colonies, where broken souls perish amid the acid fog choked mineshafts? <laughs> Han, Lando and co start a localised rebellion, then just take off. They don't bring a single slave with them. All the Wookiees that Chewbacca briefly freed will be killed when the rebellion is inevitably put down or executed thereafter. Every droid that L3 Waller Bridge freed will be summarily destroyed. Anyone who is even suspected of involvement in the uprising will be killed, probably in a very painful way, to serve as a warning to the others, and the work in the mines will continue. The fact that Han, Lando and Amelia Clark don't bring even one slave with them out of the death mines shows that they were merely using the slaves for entirely selfish reasons, but were quite happy to leave them to be killed or rot to death in slavery thereafter. They were using the slaves as tools, and when they were done with those tools, were content to leave them to die. From a moral perspective, this makes them no better than the slavers. Could they not have taken just one slave with them to signal to the audience that their moral comportment is at least one rung above that of the slavers that work people to death in acid fumes spewing mines? One of the writers, Jonathan Kazdan, himself pointed out a major plot hole, quote, If Dryden Voss is so concerned about exposing his gang in the Kessel heist, 
Why does he send his most trusted aide Kira to be the most visible member of the team that steals the coaxium? It seems to me that he's going to have to kill her almost immediately just to separate himself from that job, so it always drove me crazy, and it was a problem that I was eager to retcon in a sequel. Fortunately, there was no sequel. Near the end, generic villain has been told by Woody Harrelson that Han has betrayed them. Han has given the real coaxium to Diversity Mascot and will deliver a fake substitute to generic villain. And generic villain, an experienced crime lord who presumably has decades of experience working with low-life trash like Woody Harrelson, just takes his word for it. After Han brings the coaxium to generic villain, all generic villain would have to do to verify the validity of Woody Harrelson's tale of betrayal is test the coaxium, which would only take a few seconds, but he doesn't do this. Even after he sees the coaxium and says, No, I mean, how'd you do it? Looks exactly like the real thing. It doesn't even occur to him that this is the real thing, that Woody Harrelson is lying for his own purposes. If Solo wasn't a smoldering heap of incoherent dross, this is what would have happened. Woody Harrelson arrives at generic villain's villa and says, Hey boss, you know that fuel I said I would steal for you, but failed to steal? Then said I would steal from somewhere else? Yeah, well I don't have it. Because Han Solo, that guy I brought with me on the job, he gave it to that vaguely diverse girl Disney keep hiring for some reason, and Han is going to bring you a fake substitute. So we should kill Han, and then steal back the real stuff from the Disney diversity mascot. Now, this is the second time Woody Harrelson has come to generic villain with bullshit, instead of the fuel he was hired to steal. At this stage, Woody Harrelson's excuses are irrelevant. He has been twice hired to do a job and twice failed, any self-respecting gang lord that wants to be taken seriously, that understands what Batman Begins crime boss Carmine Falcone calls the power of fear, would kill Woody Harrelson on the spot. The words that come out of Woody Harrelson's mouth are not a substitute for success or a justification for failure. He must be killed. When Han arrives, the coaxium is tested, it's legit, so Han gets paid and sent off on another job. Whatever bollocks Woody Harrelson was trying to spin doesn't matter, his corpse is dumped into a trash compactor and he becomes just one more forgotten face among the endlessly rotating door of scum and villainy. But what does generic villain do in the movie? Completely takes Woody Harrelson at his word, lets him hang around freely while they wait for Han and doesn't even disarm him. Which later allows Woody Harrelson to do this. Back him, what are you doing? Generic villain lets Han bring the apparently fake coaxium into the villa, ignoring completely the strong possibility that this is a bomb given to Han by diversity mascot. Generic villain then sends a small strike force to the exact location Woody Harrelson told him to send them to in order to retrieve the real coaxium. It does not at any point occur to generic villain that this is a double cross being set up by Woody Harrelson or that Woody Harrelson has simply been bribed by diversity mascot to join her or that Han and Woody Harrelson are conspiring together to kill him and keep the real coaxium for themselves. Generic villain just completely, without question or reservation, takes the criminal for hire at his word after this criminal has just returned from his second failed mission in a row. Generic villain presumably knows that Amelia Clark is a very dangerous, well-trained murderess, and yet he allows her into the same room as him and lets her sit down right next to him after he has discovered her betrayal. There are three potential existential threats in the room, Han, Chewbacca, and Amelia Clark, and generic villain has two guards. Why? Why not have four guards, or six guards, or eight guards? This is very stupid. At the very end of the movie, Han says a small quantity of coaxium is worth about 10,000, maybe enough for a decent buy-in. Despite the exact same quantity only being worth This is worth five, six hundred credits. That's more than you said we'd need. At the start of the movie, but perhaps the Fed took over the Empire's monetary policy in the intervening time and their policies have resulted in 1,666% inflation. Solo, a Star Wars story, is an absolute mess. 
The premise makes no sense. The story is torn to shreds by plot holes. Character behaviour is erratic and inconsistent. There are many plot contrivances. Oh look Han, there's that girl you've been trying to get back to. She just happened to be at the first party you attended after deserting from the Empire. L3 Waller Bridge is one of the worst characters not just in Star Wars but ever. If this political statement masquerading as a character was just removed from Solo entirely, the movie would be considerably better as a result. The level of insufferable that L3 Waller Bridge achieves is so cosmic in scale that the power of the force is insignificant next to it. Neither Darth Maul's top half nor its coping mechanism for phallic incapacity should be in the film. 15 year old girls are not mega ninjas. Woody Harrelson can't remember if he's on the set of a Star Wars movie or that TV show whose name he also can't remember. Generic villain is supposed to be a powerful ruthless gang lord but is a complete moron whose gullibility is matched only by the power of Amelia Clark's girl boss badassery. Because of course we can't have a man overcome the final boss, it must be a woman. The movie ruins the Millennium Falcon and I'm not even going to get into the rotten memories that are littered throughout this cinematic miscarriage. And they turned Lando Calrissian into a pervert who likes to fuck kitchen appliances. Speaking of which, we now move on to the deconstruction of Lando Calrissian. Quick note, to avoid confusion, I will be referring to the real Lando Calrissian as Lando and the deconstructionist distortion of the character that appears in Solo as Lan Donald. Disney focused their attack against Lando's character on four main areas, his sexuality, his morality, his masculinity and his intelligence. As previously mentioned, Lando was turned from a charismatic ladies man who was straighter than the incision Obi-Wan made in Darth Maul's midsection into a sexually oblique weirdo who likes to use his droid as a metallic sex doll. And just in case there arises any doubt or confusion as to whether or not Lan Donald actually uses his droid as a masturbatory aid, Solo makes the answer kyber crystal clear. How would that work? It works. Disney also go out of their way to ensure that the audience know that Lan Donald's love for L3 Waller Bridge is unrequited. I'm sure you've noticed that Lando has feelings for me, which makes working together difficult because I do not feel the same way about him. Just to humiliate the character that little bit more, and to spite anyone who admired the real Lando's debonair charm. So why did Disney turn Lando Calrissian into a sexual degenerate? And yes, anyone who attempts carnal interaction with a vaguely human shaped piece of metal is an irredeemable degenerate. Present company excluded, of course. The reason Disney did this is because of course they fucking did it. This is current year Disney. A masculine alpha male ladies man is to Disney what a Jedi is to a Sith. Disney look at a character like Lando Calrissian, confident, self-possessed, charming, successful, good with the ladies, an effective leader, everything a man shouldn't be in current year and feel the need to absolutely demolish him. Disney need the viewer to know that this isn't the 80s anymore where men get to behave in accordance with their innate biological drives and social imperatives. Welcome, I'm Lando Calrissian. I'm the administrator of this facility. And who might you be? Leia. Welcome, Leia. This is the era of the perpetual current year. Welcome, I'm Lando Calrissian. I'm the administrator of this facility. Fuck you! Fuck you! Get the fuck out of here! Fuck you, man. Get the fuck out. There was zero chance that Disney was ever going to respect Lando's character and depict him as he was presented to us in Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi because that character exudes confident masculine energy or as the regime calls it, toxic masculinity. In The Empire Strikes Back, Lando demonstrates leadership, intelligence and self-control in his dealing with a horribly difficult situation he finds himself in. I had no choice. They arrived right before you did. I'm sorry. But he has no intention of leaving his friend to die in Imperial hands and when the time is right, he acts. <laughs> Well done. Rather than become overly emotional and just start a shooting war with the Empire, which will result in a bloodbath and inevitable defeat, 
He does the smart thing. He decides to double cross the Empire. He makes the Empire think that he will cooperate freely with them and, when the opportunity arises, makes his play to free Han. And listen to his announcement to Cloud City about the Empire taking control of the city. Attention. This is Lando Carissian. Attention. The Empire is taking control of the city. I advise everyone to leave before more Imperial troops arrive. He shows no surprise, no feeling of betrayal or anger. He was expecting this. Probably from the moment Vader arrived, he knew Cloud City's number was up. And Lando making an announcement to encourage anyone who could to leave the city before an Imperial garrison arrived demonstrates conscientiousness. It demonstrates that Lando is aware of his responsibilities as a leader and feels compelled to fulfill those responsibilities. This is a moral man and a good leader. In Solo, Lan Donald does not possess any of the traits that Lando demonstrates in Cloud City. When the gang is on Castle to steal the coaxium, Lan Donald allows his loose cannon droid to enter the facility, despite knowing that L3 Waller Bridge is a loud, attention-drawing calamity of a machine. Oh really? How about you have a go at me, you lumpy brutes? Yeah. Ah! And yet it does not occur to him that allowing this malfunctioning malcontent of a malicious maniac to enter the castle mine with Han, Chewie and Amelia Clark might endanger the mission. And sure enough, Vladimir L3H Ulyanov kicks off the droid Shivik revolution, putting the entire crew in mortal peril as a result. While this is happening, Lan Donald is safe and cozy on the Falcon doing this. The Calrissian Chronicles, chapter five, continued. Personally, I wasn't all that impressed with the Cheru. Quite apart from the many negative character traits this little gag infers, Lando taking a brief moment to wank off to his own reflection, reflection myself. is an example of the film trading narrative consistency for a cheap laugh. Earlier, the movie shows Landonald express a deep dread of entering the castle mines. Mining colonies are the worst. And yet, literally a few minutes later, when he is in the mining colony, surrounded by human suffering and death, he seems to have forgotten all about his dread of entering this hellscape of agony and misery, and is content to just chill out and work on his autobiography. The film established a good setup when Lando related that he has first-hand experience of mining colonies, but it never delivers the payoff, instead preferring to throw in a disposable joke based on Disney's misinterpretation of Lando as a narcissist. There was so much potential here. Here is just one example of how the film could have delivered on the Castle Mines setup. Lando emerges from the Falcon with the gang, posing as a slaver, but when he steps into the stinking, smouldering sights, sounds and smells around him, he quickly becomes nauseous, distressed and dizzy. But not wanting to draw attention, he presses on. Everything goes smoothly and as planned, though Lando is looking increasingly green around the gills. The team are on the way out. Han and Lando are escorting the coaxium to the Falcon down a tunnel when Lando sees a slave girl being beaten horribly by an overseer. He tries to ignore it, but overcome by some past trauma that seems to take possession of his body, he pulls out his blaster and shoots the overseer. All hell breaks loose. Lando grabs the woman who is now barely conscious and the gang fight their way to the Falcon. They manage to escape with the woman and later she joins Diversity Mascot's Rebellion. While flying away from Castle, Han and Lando are alone in the cockpit. Emilia Clark is tending to the woman and not in the room because not every male space needs to be invaded by women all the time, everywhere. Hello, what have we here? Welcome, I'm Lando Calrissian. You I'm need something. I'm the administrator of this facility. You need something? We can finally just chill out with Han and Lando, free from the constant interruption of girl bosses and feminist analogues. Han asks Lando what happened back there, and Lando relates a heart-wrenching tale about the horrifying torture of a prisoner on a mining colony that he witnessed during a dirty business deal he became involved in. He always regretted not doing anything about it. This not only delivers on the promised payoff, it develops Lando's character by relating the moral ambiguity of his past and his inherent hatred of injustice. It also couples well with Lando's actions in Cloud City, where Lando could have just taken his 30 pieces and left Han, Leia and Chewie to be crucified, but his emotional connection to Han and his desire to do the right thing ultimately determine his action. In the Despot rewrite of the castle scene, Lando could just take the coaxium and leave, abandoning this miserable dying slave girl to her fate. 
but his emotional repulsion to such an injustice and his desire to do the right thing get the better of him. So he acts, and in doing so, saves one life. In Cloud City, he sacrifices his access to the wealth of Cloud City in an attempt to save Han. In the mines, he risks his cut of the coaxium to save the life of a slave girl. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of if they rhyme. Mm -hmm. Every stanza kind of rhymes with the last one. The film could also use the Han and Lando scene to remind the audience of just how ruthless, scummy and villainous an unredeemed Han was. He could respond to Lando's story with something like, So are you just going to save every slave in the galaxy now? That girl would have been dead in a week. Yeah, well, you can't save anyone when you're the one who's dead. But if I talk about how this movie got Han wrong, we'll be here until the Force finally expires and the galaxy is left a cold and dark abyss. But briefly stated, the solo iteration of Han has absolutely no trace of the dark edge that emanated from the OT Han Solo. Oh, and by the way, while Lando is carrying the girl to the Falcon, he orders L3 Waller Bridge outside and uses her as a shield against blaster fire because droid lives don't fucking matter. <laughs> Especially L3 Waller Bridges. Disney choose to insert the Lando memoir entry into the castle scene because they believe that Lando is a narcissist. He is an attractive, successful, confident, wealthy man, well liked by the ladies. Therefore, he must be a narcissist. When a woman is these things, she is... Fearless, fair, brave and true. But when a man is these things, he's a narcissist. And so it makes sense to Disney that he would take some time to talk to himself about himself in the midst of what is essentially a death camp. Now on to Lando's comportment in battle. In Return of the Jedi, General Lando leads the attack on the second Death Star. The fleet is ambushed. It's a trap! And during the resulting battle, Lando demonstrates all of the traits which were established as integral elements of his character in Empire Strikes Back. Firstly, his intelligence. We've got to be able to get some kind of a reading on that shield up or down. Well, how could they be jamming us if they don't know if we're coming? He quickly figures out that the Death Star's shield is still up and that the rebel fleet has fallen into a trap. It's a trap! Break off the attack! Shield is still up. Lando's action here saves the entire fighter fleet from crashing into the Death Star shield. Later, in one of the most fucking based Chad moves in all of Star Wars, he orders an all-out suicidal attack on the Star Destroyer fleet. Yes, I said closer. Move as close as you can and engage those Star Destroyers at point blank range. As Banzai batshit magnificent as this move is, it is actually the smartest possible thing the Rebels can do. I if that goes right, we won't last long against those Star Destroyers. We'll last longer than we will against that Death Star. And we might just take a few of them with us. If they retreat, this is a disastrous defeat. A public humiliation for the Rebel Alliance that will be broadcast to the galaxy and a huge blow to the morale of the Rebels, which will likely result in large-scale desertion and the general feeling that the cause is lost. Lando understands this. All craft prepare to retreat. You won't get another chance of this, Admiral. He knows that this is an all or nothing battle, and so, rather than a retreat which will doom the rebellion, he orders an all out attack. He uses the desperation of the rebels as a weapon against the Imperial fleet. Through quick thinking, force of personality, quality of leadership and good generalship, Lando keeps the rebels in the fight at their lowest point. Our cruisers can't repel firepower of that magnitude. And we'll have that shield down. We've got to give him more time. He does all this despite receiving a massive shock and morale blow when the Death Star destroys an Alliance capital ship. Uh, oh! That blast came from the Death Star. That thing's operational. Now let's examine the martial comportment of Landonald during the battle that erupts as he and the gang escape castle. His actions are driven entirely by his emotions. The real Lando would remain outside the crossfire zone, continue to fire on the enemy until the crew is secured, then leave. 
That's it. The pile of junk that until recently was his droid would not factor into his decision making at this point. Even if he wanted to keep the droid, Lando, being a quick thinker, would recognize immediately that the droid was gone and keep his cool. Lan Donald, not being the real Lando, abandons the defense of the Falcon's crew, enters the crossfire zone, makes himself a larger, slower target by grabbing L3 Waller Bridge, gets hit, cries and wails like a toddler that's lost his favorite toy, and has to be rescued by one of the adults. It's fucking pathetic. Lan Donald's actions endanger his own life and the entire crew. The real Lando steadied himself in the midst of an emotional earthquake when he saw thousands of rebels killed in the same moment it was revealed that the Death Star was operational and the entire fleet was in danger. He not only remained an effective soldier in battle, he demanded that the rest of the rebel fleet do the same and follow his orders. When Lan Donald's favorite sex doll gets hit in the castle skirmish, he responds thusly. L3? L3! Lan Donald possesses none of the self-control, intelligence, quick thinking, basic tactical awareness and leadership qualities of Lando. That is not Lando Calrissian. Finally, Lando is turned from a highly intelligent man into a complete moron. Lando was able to make himself a business magnate and leader of Cloud City, successfully double crosses the Empire in Cloud City despite the presence of Darth Vader. He was able to infiltrate Jabba's palace and kept his cover even after Leia got herself captured. By the way, contrary to popular belief, the rescue of Han Solo makes perfect sense. I explain it in one of this channel's earlier videos. The link is in the description. Lando is able to convince the rebels to give him the rank of general, suggesting excellent powers of negotiation, consistent with his skills as a businessman. And in the Battle of Endor, he leads the rebel fleet out of the Empire's trap. It's a trap! Calculates that this is the Rebellion's last stand, keeps the fleet in the battle long enough for Han to get the Death Star shield down, and ultimately achieves victory. All of this demonstrates an extremely high level of intelligence. In Solo, a Star Wars story, the film would have us believe that the same man who achieved all of the aforementioned is stupid enough to let L3 Waller Bridge into the castle mines, contribute nothing to the planning of the heist, abandon a defensive position and risk his crew's life to go reclaim a pile of scrap. And during a high stakes poker game with gangsters and criminals who are presumably experienced gamblers, cheat. And how does Lan Donald cheat? By hiding a card up his sleeve. This is incredibly stupid for several reasons. Quick note, for the sake of intelligibility, I will be using 52 card deck terminology in this section. Firstly, hiding a card up your sleeve is the most obvious, primitive and easily discovered cheat in poker. Yep. There would be players on the table and in the crowd who would be looking very closely for any indication of cheating. If you walk into the game with a card up your sleeve, you will be caught. Landonald's second biggest concern should be that he is literally surrounded by onlookers. If he goes for his cheat card, it does not matter how discreetly he does it, someone will see him cheating. What makes Landonald's secreting of an ace up his sleeve even stupider is that he only plays it during the biggest pot. As someone who was addicted to on online poker during its mid to late 2000s heyday and followed the poker world closely, I can attest that during a big pot, everyone is watching with great attention to detail. The worst time to pull a card from your sleeve would be during a big pot, when the eyes of the room are fixed upon you. The last and most obvious reason Lando's crude cheating technique will assuredly fail is that his card is either a duplicate of a card already in play or has been pulled from the deck at the start of the game. If it has been pulled from the deck, someone will notice. A dealer and any experienced gambler will know the difference between a 51 and a 52 card deck. If anyone gets suspicious, they may count the deck or, as frequently happens in high stakes poker, they will demand that the old deck be discarded and a fresh deck be opened in front of them before they sit down to play, which would render Lando's spur card redundant. Let's suppose Lando has an ace of hearts up his sleeve and he swaps out an eight of clubs for his ace to make an ace high flush, while surrounded by a large crowd but apparently without anyone noticing. Several things can go wrong and one of them will go wrong. 
Firstly, after Lando reveals his hand, one of the players who folded earlier in the hand was holding an Ace of Hearts, which he produces from the muck, exposing Lando. Secondly, a player gets suspicious and demands that all cards be turned face up, exposing Lando's card as a duplicate. Thirdly, Lando's cards are examined by a suspicious gambler and it is discovered that his Ace of Spades is of a different texture or material, exposing it as coming from a different deck. Fourth, the player across from Lando is holding the real Ace of Hearts. Fifth, a player gets suspicious, demands that the deck be counted, and it is discovered that there are 53 cards in play, including Lando's duplicate. Landonald's ace up his sleeve cheat is supremely idiotic and has no chance of working. Landonald is not only a cheater, an utterly immoral character trait that is incompatible with the OT Lando, he is a profoundly shit cheater. Disney took an intelligent, just man and turned him into a moron who can't even cheat at cards properly. When I was about 11 years old, I read a Star Wars Junior novel entitled Zorba the Hutt's Revenge, a fun little kids book which I don't really remember, but it has an abysmal score on Goodreads and I thoroughly enjoyed it. One scene I do remember from this book is one in which Zorba, Jabba the Hutt's father, beats Lando at a game of poker. Zorba shows up in Cloud City to claim his dead son's casino. Lando rejects the claim, but agrees to stake the casino and Cloud City against Zorba's wealth in a game of Sabacc. Under the condition that they use the house deck, Zorba refuses, suggesting the house deck is probably rigged and insists on using his own deck. Lando has been watching Zorba lose money all day and, assuming him to be a ripe target, agrees. Importantly, Lando carefully inspects Zorba's deck twice before agreeing to play with it. Lando loses and it later transpires that Zorba was using a deck with markings of ultraviolet paint that only Huts can see. This short novel, whose target demographic is adolescent children, respected its readers more more than Solo A Star Wars Story respects its audience. The authors did not have Zorba win by pulling a card from up his sleeve because they knew that an 11 year old boy would read that and think, that's really fucking dumb. Donald Glover's performance as Land Donald is fine. He does a fairly convincing impersonation of Lando and does what he can with an awful script and a total misinterpretation of the character. Though he was of course faced with the same problem that Jared Leto wasn't faced with when he didn't play the Joker. I am not someone who is loved. I'm an idea. Performing a popular character after audiences have fallen in love with the previous actor's performance. By erasing my mind. There is one more scene we must examine. When Han and Lando sit down in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon together, this is the first time the audience have seen these two characters alone together since Return of the Jedi. It is the perfect opportunity for the film to just take a breath and let these two beloved characters play off each other for a few minutes, feel each other out, build chemistry, Tree and let the audience soak it all up. Instead, this happens. Excuse me, get your presumptuous ass out of my seat. If this had been the real Star Wars, which attempted to remain faithful to the characters as originally conceived, rather than to remake them in the highest and most holy image of the update for a modern audience, Han, without even looking at the pesky droid, would have turned to Lando and said, Turn that thing off, will you? Lando would have casually obliged, and the two would spend the next half hour trading knowledge of ships, gear porn, and the occasional wisecrack at each other's expense, while Amelia Clark occasionally drops in to jealously compete for their attention. Attention. But unfortunately, this isn't the real Star Wars galaxy. These characters are not meant to portray the personalities conceived by George Lucas. This is Disney Star Wars. So, oh, my sacral occipital circuit is sticking. You're gonna have to do that thing again later. Yeah. Regular viewers of this channel know that I am fond of quoting 1984, and while I am aware that reference to 1984 in the criticism of one's enemies is a cliché, I will nevertheless continue to do so, as Orwell's opus is an endless source of wisdom and guidance. Here is a quote from the book about the nature of power. Power is tearing human minds apart and putting them together again in new shapes of your own choosing. That is exactly what Disney did with Lando Calrissian. They tore the character apart and put him back together again in shapes of their own choosing. These new shapes included sexual perversion, emotional incontinence, stupidity, narcissism and weakness. No. It isn't time to reappraise Solo A Star Wars Story. This movie isn't better than you remember. 
It's far worse. No, Solo isn't the most underrated Star Wars movie. That would be Return of the Jedi. If anything, Solo is the most overrated because to the extent that Star Wars fans think of it at all, they think of it as a mediocre movie when it is, in fact, total trash that feels even to approach mediocrity. Solo, a Star Wars story, is a piece of deservedly forgotten Disney Lucasfilm shite. Well, you said it. Thanks for listening, subscribe, and don't forget to Trap. the like button. Ground City's always looking for new talent. You think you have what it takes? <laughs>